sight in black powder. It is a class A explosive. It's highly dangerous, volatile, very unpredictable stuff. The men of the 44th Georgia are trained and experienced at using that black powder safely. But here in the Park Service, we're concerned with your safety. That's paramount with us. So we want to separate you folks from any of the potential problems that do exist when you handle and fire a Class A explosive. And we keep that distance in case there's a problem out in the field with it, so you're safe by this very expensive hair. <laughs> so you can come right up. Get nice and close, get right up to the barricade, but please, just for your own safety during the course of the fire and demonstration, do not go beyond it. We also ask you if you'd please respect the perimeters of the barricade. Gives you plenty of room to take the pictures. We just don't want anyone going out in front of those lights. So. And then, when the 44th Georgia is completed with their weapons and tactics part of their program, you can follow them back into camp. And that would be a great opportunity. You can ask any questions. Uh, they're very knowledgeable, very engaging folks. So spend some time with them in camp, and they can answer most, if not all, your questions you have. We'd like to thank you folks for coming out and supporting our living history. And when you do, look for the 44th Georgia on our 2019 calendar for living history. And I tell you what, for years, too many to, to count now. 44 George has been volunteering coming into the park, and I tell you what, every weekend over the years that I spend with them, they've always made my stay with them very, very low-key around here. So to introduce you to the weapons and tactics of the infantry soldier, I'd like to introduce you to a gentleman who's been doing this for many, many years. He's extremely knowledgeable about the weapons and tactics, to share some of his knowledge the commander of the 44th Georgia, and my good friend, Mr. Clark Van Buskirk. Clark. on a horse. I would have command of five companies in battle, a wing. And as a wing commander, as a major, I have different obligations. I have to follow my colonel as to his wishes. If you can't hear me, please move in. I will not be any louder than what I am here. As my men will tell you very quickly, the Major doesn't talk loud, but you better listen to what he has to say. How do you take a young boy or girl today, and all, girls are all part of this, even though I might not mention it. How do you teach them to go kill another man? very difficult. George Washington had that problem. There's been that problem since the day one. Simplest way to put it that I've seen is simplest way to put it a soldier doesn't dislike or hate his enemy. He loves what's home, his wife and his family. He's fighting for them. We have to teach a young man to kill another young man. And as I said before, that includes ladies now. Okay? The weapons that we start this war are designed to kill you at 50 yards. 
1843 Springfield that shoots a ball, a round ball that's almost three quarters of an inch in diameter, and three buck shots. Three double O buck shots. It's called Buck and Ball. There is a monument to a group out by the angle. You stand at the angle and you look towards the Virginia Monument. It will be on your right hand side going down the road. And on the top of it you'll see a ball and three round balls. They carried that rifle in that battle. Now the tactics that we use are designed for that rifle. They're designed to kill you at 50 yards. By the time we get to Gettysburg, we have a mini ball that we fire, and it'll kill you at 500 yards. Then we go from 50 yards to 500 yards in two years. Obviously, to say, our tactics didn't change. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through this tactic part of how they fire. I'm going to demonstrate all but one tactic and when I get to there, I'll explain it to you. It takes nine steps to load this weapon. Nine different things you have to do. I could take this whole group of mine back to camp, we could put on blue coats, which we wouldn't do, but come out of here and I would give you the exact same presentation. A fellow by the name of Napoleon wrote the book. We were educated indirectly by Napoleon. We used his way of fighting designed for a weapon that will kill you at 50 yards. Obviously we got a problem because our tactics don't match our weaponry. Our weaponry takes nine steps to load and it's loaded at the barrel, not at the breech. You're all used to breech-loaded guns, that's what new guns and guns are still loaded by. We load it from the barrel, which what makes it a musket. So, names you're going to hear these fellas use are the names of the original men they represent that were here on July the 1st. 1863. Now, as they go through this presentation, what you're going to hear are the names of the men that actually were here and actually would have been doing the part. It's something unique to the 44th Georgia. Captain. Sir. No nine count. Yes, sir. First Sergeant McRae. Demonstrate load nine count. Corporal Paul Knox, front and center. He wants the private, go him in the load nine count. Private Whitehead, front and center. You will demonstrate the load of nine count. Load! Command load is when he would load his rifle. Handle cartridge. In his cartridge box are 40 rounds. They're packed 10 to a package, and in each package of 10, there's one blue round. It's in blue paper. It's the Williams cleaner bullet. They use that bullet in the ninth and tenth round they fire. 
because it looks like it's got a dime in the bottom of it. And what it does, it cleans the barrel, which will allow them to continue to use the gun. If they don't clean the gun, by the time you get to the 11th and 12th bullet, you can't ram it down in. There's too much dirt and crud in the barrel that's left from the powder. Tear cartridge! What's neat about that command, tear cartridge, and I'm going to repeat this, in 1938, the United States Army Infantry eliminated the fact that you had to have your forefront teeth to be an infantry soldier. So you could tear a cartridge. <laughs> I will repeat that. In 1938 is when the infantry decided they didn't need four teeth to tear a cartridge. And we stopped tearing cartridges in 1865. <laughs> so when they tell you that they did things pretty quickly in the old days, they talk with forked tongue. <laughs> <laughs> he also has 20 rounds in his haversack. A haversack would be probably known better as a lady's bag. <laughs> but at that time, men carried a bag called a haversack. So every soldier coming on the field has 60 rounds with him when he's going into the fight. And I can assure you, in the battles I've been in, I've gone through all 60 and probably 30 more to boot. They go quickly. Charge cartridge! At this point in time, what he does is he'll put in 60 grains of black powder and then he'll take a mini ball that I'm going to pass around. The term mini ball is its bullet. And what's unique about it, it weighs one ounce. And I'm sure that sometime in your life somebody has said to you, it takes one ounce of lead to kill you. That's where it comes from. It's a Civil War thing. It's not a modern thing. It comes from the Civil War. It comes from the fact that the bullet weighs one ounce. And it passes around so you can use some. Now the last person that has it, please give it back to me. That bullet looks like a football. It will kill you at 500 yards. Draw rammer. Ram cartridge. If he neglects, because of the heat of battle, to do the next step, he's in deep trouble. Because when he fires his gun, the bullet goes downfield, true, so does his rammer. And without the rammer, he's got a nine pound club because you can't load the rifle if you don't have a rammer. Return rammer. <laughs> often joke about that, and it is a joke, but it really doesn't occur. But in the heat of battle, a fellow fires his rammer down. He looks at his partner and says, can I, use your bar can I borrow your rammer? And his partner says, no, you already lost one. I'm not going to give you the second <laughs> Shoulder arm. We're going to move him over there and face him Left away. face. Because up Forward until this march. point, the gun was empty. There was no powder in it. Now there's powder in it. It's now becoming Left face. a weapon. Prime! The command prime, he reaches in and he picks out a little brass cap that sits on the nipple. And if you've ever fired a, you don't have to hold your ears yet, huh? I'll tell you. <coughs> if you've 
you've ever fired a cap gun as a young boy or young girl, you know there's a red strip with black dots on it. Well, the black dots are fulminated mercury. If you can't hear, you got to move up. The black dots are fulminated mercury. That's what's inside the cap. It's what creates the spark that lights the powder that makes the gun fire. You can think that it's instantaneously. It's not, but it really <coughs> is compared to the other weapons. Ready! Now cover your ears. Aim! Fire! Prime! Prime! With the weather the way it is, and the dampness in the air, a lot of times the powder doesn't get all the way down. We're going to have a misfire. So hopefully Ready! Aim! Fire! Recover arm! How far is 500 yards? Shoulder arms! Pass that tree line. Face. Turn the ranks. If you were hit with a bullet, the bullet would we penetrate in. But so with the clothing. Demonstration complete. And your clothing is dirty. Oh, thank you. you. Turn around. And it would get dirt inside the wound from your cloth, and it would become infected. Attention company, shoulder arm. If you were shot in either of your legs or arms, and it hit a bone, it would shatter like a chicken bone. And just like it, it shatters it. Obviously, the only way they could fix it with this fall on the wall. Boom! They would fall the arms and the legs off. If you were shot in the stomach area, this area, you were going to die. At the point in time that you were going to die. There's nothing they could do. If you were shot in the head, depending on where you were shot, you might survive, you might not. Are the bullets deadly? Yes, they are. The gun's accurate. You'll see the, I can attest to that. As a wing commander, I would have five companies. So I'm demonstrating one company. And what we're going to do, one of my first, my first exhibition, is to be firing my company. All five of my companies on my wing that would be under my control are going to fire at one time. Company ready? Aim! Aim! Now, if you witness the low nine count, it takes 20 seconds. The average Civil War soldier could fire three rounds a minute. 95% including myself. I cannot load and fire my weapon three times in a minute. It tells you how good they were and how bad we are <laughs> with the same weapon. This time I had was a minute, four seconds. And that was without putting bullets. So you can see they were very proficient. Now the key to that is I fired five companies for 20 seconds. I have no de no defense. If I'm firing against 50 yard weapon, you can cover 50 yards in 20 seconds. So if I'm using their tactics, the Napoleonic tactics, you can start to understand. It's designed for a weapon that will kill you at 50 yards. But unfortunately, these guns will kill you at 500 yards. And you're not going to cover 500 yards in 20 seconds. Very few bayonet charges, very few bayonet wounds in the Civil War because of the weaponry. But the tactics never caught up. By the time we got to Gettysburg here, we have now weapons and we start to entrench, which is World War I tactics.
So we start off with pre-World War I tactics and end up using World War I tactics without tanks. My second evolution of firing is I have two ranks, a front rank and a rear rank. Firing my rank, Captain. Rear rank, ready! fire at half my men. If you were in front of the gun, you would not know that. You would think they all fired. So if you decide to charge me, I still got half of them loaded. The downside is I only used half my... Front right, ready! Aim! Aim. I only used half my firepower. And the front ranks don't fire until the rear ranks are loaded. And the rear rank won't fire until the front rank is loaded. Mm -hmm. So by going and firing my rank, I can slow down my fire, but I can fire six times a minute instead of three times a minute. Mm -hmm. So I've done one that allows me to change. Because remember when I started this, I said I wanted the third one. The third one, I do not have enough men on the field due to the weather. To show you the move properly, it's firing by file. Each two men are a file. It's one of the neatest fires you're going to see if you go to a major reenactment. Because if USV or AMV is up there and they have a brigade of, of men out in the field, it's bang, 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 bang. And you sit there, and about the time you tell your wife or your husband, hey, look at that, that was pretty neat. Chaos breaks out. The firing comes from all over. It's the only time after you fired your first round that you load and fire at your speed in the Civil War. Any other time, you must be given orders to fire. But that time, if you fire the first round, that's how fast you can load the fire. That's our third evolution. Now, everything I showed you is great. The moment the target's in front of me, what happens if the target's out there in the trees? The target's free fire on the trees. Firing by the right oblique. Ready? fire to the right, 15 degrees, I can fire to the left. The problem firing to the left here with the park service is I'm firing at a bus <laughs> and the park gets sort of upset and bus drivers do too when people are firing at them. So we don't fire that way. But as a wing commander, I have five companies. I can take my right two companies, fire left, take my fourth and fifth company, fire to the right, have the middle company fire straight ahead, and I can bring fire upon one poor Yankee company that I will decimate and create a hole in the Yankee line. So you can start to see how I can, by how I fire and how my men fire, allows me a lot of variation. Now everybody's seen this young boy come out with me, come out with the company, and he's not here for window dressing. He has his job to do. Boys under 16 were drummers on both sides. And the drummers in a battle, I can assure you, it's very noisy and it's hard to communicate. But I can use my drummer as a, as a way of communicating and having my men fire. I'm going to give the command to my captain to fire my drum call. Company, firing by drum. And you realize that he has 
Hines has been here for window dressing. He has a job to do. I can assure you at Chancellorsville two years ago I had two 12 uh, inch howitzers behind me about from me to the road and they fired while we were behind the wall and I heard bells ringing for the next uh, week and a half because when the howitzer goes off even the ground shatters it's quite noisy it's a way for me to fire my whole brigade and my regiment and my wing using one drum now the drummers were there Number one, to keep us in line when we march. Number two, to fire if we necessary. And number three, for our entertainment. We usually had a fiddler player, somebody played the fiddle. And we spent the night around the campfire with our drummer and our fiddler. And if you've ever done that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, you should put it on your bucket list because it's something you want to do in, in your lifetime. Sit around the fire and listen to good music. Now we fired, I've showed you how we fire. We'll fire by company again. Fire by company. they're doing is they're priming the weapon to make sure that the weapon is in fact safe and that all the powder has been burned out of it. So they're going to put the little primer on. They're going to go through three or uh, two rounds Ready. just to be sure that it's safe. So the right. weapon, you'll hear that and you won't hear the bang on all three. As I stated, I couldn't have done this in blue and giving me the same talk. One of the famous, right. one of the famous quotes in Secretary Stewart is sitting in the office with Abe Lincoln. And Abe looks over at the secretary and says, I don't understand it, Mr. Stewart. I outnumber the Confederates four to one, and I can't take their position. Yet when we were in Mexico, I could capture whatever I wanted with the same group of men. And Secretary Stewart said, looked at Abe Lincoln, and said, the difference was, sir, they were fighting with you in Mexico and you're fighting against you. Somebody, the ribs were tough. What we're going to do, I'm going to bring them around, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit of the history when I send them back to camp of the 44th. The 44th is probably one of the elite groups out of the South. They're part of General Dole's Brigade, Rhodes Division, Mule's Corps. They come on the battlefield on July 1st at 11 a.m. They have marched down to Carlisle, Pennsylvania. They have been in camp at Carlisle for over a week. And what's neat about the camp is the difference between the North and the South is the South never burnt the North like Sherman and Sheraton did to the South. They tried to starve the southern people out by burning the clocks. When we crossed the Mason-Dixon line from the north, Bobby Lee sent out a general order, there will be no pillaging, no stealing, and no theft. When we marched into Carlisle on a Sunday afternoon, we dirty brown colored guys marching off a dirt road had the people of Carlisle scared to 
that. Here come these reds. What are we going to do? And they found out very quickly, number one, they didn't burn nothing. Number two, they went, whatever they needed, if they went in the town had it, they paid for it. Yes, they paid for it with Confederate money, <laughs> but Confederate money at that time, like today, actual Confederate money is worth a lot of money. And I can tell you that. My wife bought me a 15 cent piece of Confederate money and she paid $45 for it. <laughs> so Confederate money is worth a lot of money if you have the real thing. So they come into Carlisle and they got the townspeople scared to death. They have no idea what's going to happen. And the first thing you have Sunday night is church service. Church to both North and South troops is very important. And they invite the town people to the church service. And some of the people go there. And to their astonishment, they find out these people speak English. Sometimes it's hard to understand the Reb, but we speak English. Wow. That astonished me. Then they found out they talk about home and their families. Wonderful home. It was old. If you're a southerner, it's not a civil war, it's a war of northern aggression. If you're a Yankee, it's a civil war. If you're Daniel Webster, you'll find out that the southern people are right northern people are wrong. And if you think I'm wrong, we're going to work on a fiction book. Look up under Daniel Webster, Civil War, and you'll find out he had all the right to be right. He had to try to overthrow your government. We didn't care what kind of government you had. We just didn't want to be part of it anymore. We wanted to go back to what we agreed. So these people are astonished at this. And they leave there with a different attitude. And on Thursday, they leave Carlisle, Pennsylvania to march south. And this is from the Carlisle newspaper. This isn't what I read or what some historian read. This is what was in the Carlisle newspaper in 1863 about the Reds leaving Carlisle. And as the Rebs march out of town, all the women have baked something for them to take with them. They had more food than they could possibly consume. Everybody had baked something for the Rebs who are marching south to fight their own army. That don't make sense, but it's true because they found out that yes, we are Americans first. We're not the bad guys, we're the good guys. Just right before. If you happen to go today in your travels, and you go to the Virginia Monument, and you get out of your car and you walk down to the end of the lane, you say to yourself, would I walk across that field? Most of them will say no. I wouldn't do that. Certain death? No. But then, I'm going to walk across that field, and if I capture that position, I get to go home. Boy, does that change the whole meaning of the sentence. That's why the men did what they had to do. goes over most all the historian's head because unless you've been a soldier you have no idea about going home putting an end to this and going home and that's what these guys did 
And that's why they talk like that, you know. To certain death. This wasn't questionable. This wasn't like driving down the road and we'll take our chances that we don't care. This is like I'm standing out in the middle of a turnpike and there's tractor trailers coming and they ain't gonna stop. Makes a difference in how you look at it. Makes a difference in how you think. Just like when they left Carlisle, made a difference. Bobby Lee, we're not destroying. We're not gonna do what Sherman and Sheriff did. I can tell you this much. The South would have won the war. There's two men would have been on the end of the rope. And that was Sherman and Sherman. They both would have been hung for what they did. I'll tell you how they stopped it. A place called Front Royal down in Virginia. Sheraton had decided he had captured a couple of Morgan's raiders and he hung them. Hung four of them. General down there, Rhodes or Ewell, was in command at the time in 1864, wrote a letter off to Sherman. The next time you hang a Confederate soldier, I'm going to hang 10 of your guys. Guess what stopped being hung? There was no more Confederates being hung because they knew damn well he captured gentlemen and stirred them up. That's the only thing the Yankees understood. We come on the field on July the 1st, 11 o'clock in the morning, north of the town. There's a plaque out there that says Dole's Brigade. We're Dole's Brigade. We're part of that brigade. Bobby Lee would ask, where's Dole? Because the brigade had four regiments in it, and guess what? They're all from Georgia. They're all Georgia boys. Georgia peaches. They hated drill. They wanted to go home. And they were terrible fighters. When they fought, they just kept right on fighting. They did not know the word surrender. Out of 1,100 plus men that served in the 44th, not one man turned in the ranch in the four years of battle. Just think about that. Out of 1,100, not one turned in the ranch. Grant knew this, which is why Grant brought on that he wouldn't exchange troops, because what he would do is he'd exchange troops. They would take captured men from Yankees and captured Confederates from Jenner. Well, the Yankees, when they gave them, sent them over to the Yankee line and would go home. The Confederates, on the other hand, when they come to the Confederate line, where's my gun? And went back in the line. And Grant knew this, and Grant had to stop him because he had to stop. He wouldn't stop the war. There's so much of the history that we're not taught, or that we're taught through a set of blue glasses. I challenge you to go move me along with some of the statements I made. Do your thing. And you're going to come back and say, man, that guy really did that. <coughs> really we now have a different outlook on picking the charge. Go stand there. Think of who is if you're a boy or a girl, it don't matter. If I'm walking across that field, I would for my wife or the time. And my children. Not even a question in my mind. I would do it for them. I would do it for something. Just a wife. But really some historian that thinks he knows everything and doesn't know a word about what he's saying. It's reality. We fought the entire war. 
We had nine men at Appomattox. That's all that's left of it. The rest of us are in Camp Lookout, Yankee Camp, Prisoner of War Camp, Maryland. <laughs> We're all captured. Of course, Grant won't release himself. He's holding us because he knows darn well if he holds enough Confederates, the war's over. There's no way the Yankees are going to win if they leave it go the way it was going. They had the, the Confederates were just too, they were outnumbered, outclassed, out everything. Am I raggedy? Yeah. If he took notice, no two of my men looked alike. If it was a Yankee demonstration on, they all looked exactly the same. We don't look like them. We grab whatever hat fits and feels comfortable, that's what you wear. The only thing on my jacket that says I'm the red besides the color is that it says Georgia Button. If any of you have any questions, I've held you up long enough. I'll be more than happy to try and answer you. If you don't, I thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy your day here at the park. The park is hollow ground. Where you're standing, the ground you're standing on, over a hundred Union troops died trying to push us out of the tree line down there. And we're from that marker, right there. To a marker up by those trees that you can't see. Which you represent, that tried to push us out. So every place you go here, men died for it on both sides. Makes it a little different when you understand the solitude.